In this next section of slides, we're going to be going through um, a little bit more details of how the NMOS and PMOS transistors work, um, how the, the MOS capacitor functionality of the MOS devices, and uh, some details on uh, actual gate and diffusion capacitances and how that affects the device behavior. So, so far, we've been treating transistors as ideal switches. Um, in reality, a transistor that's on only passes a finite amount of current, and the amount of current that it can pass will depend on the, the voltage at the different terminals of the transistor. So your voltage at your drain, your gate, and your source uh, will determine how much current is flowing through. So what we'd like to do is actually be able to derive our current voltage relationships um, in order to determine how fast we can actually switch the output of whatever, um, whatever logic that we're creating, uh, the logic gate, we wanna know how fast the output will change uh, with time. So uh, the thing to keep in mind is our transistor gate, source, and drain all have some capacitance associated with them. And if we go back to our uh, current voltage relationships for a capacitor, the current through a capacitor is equal to the capacitance C times dV over dt, so the change in voltage over the change in time. So we can take that current voltage relationship for a capacitor, um, figure out the, the dt, how much time does it take for that capacitor value to, to switch um, from one to zero, would equal the capacitance C divided by the current times dV, which is the change in voltage that you expect. So usually dV is gonna be zero to ground, um, so like it's your VCC value or VDD value um, to do a full switching from, from zero to VDD. And uh, the amount of time that it will take is taking that, that voltage times capacitance over current. So basically our capacitance and our current will determine our speed since our voltage value is a given. So if we have a MOS capacitor, which is our gate capacitor, um, the, basically from the gate, we have an oxide, and then we have the body or bulk of the device, and that forms our MOS capacitor for our transistor. And we have three operating modes. Um, so here I'm showing the, the basis. We have our polysilicon gate, silicon dioxide insulator between that and um, this is showing if we had an NMOS device, we'd have a P-type body um, underneath the gate. Uh, so the first type of uh, operation is if our gate value is less than zero, so we actually have a negative amount of voltage on the gate relative to the body. Uh, then we'll actually be attracting, since we have negative charges on the gate, we'll actually be attracting more positive charges to the, the surface of the silicon dioxide insulator um, on the P body and we'll be accumulating charge. So there will actually be more P charges there than there normally would be. Um, so that's one operating mode. Second operating mode is depletion. So let's say we put a positive voltage on the gate, but the value or the, the level of positive voltage is less than the threshold voltage um, for the gate. So this is depletion where we're pushing P charges away from the uh, P bulk or P body that's right on underneath the gate oxide insulator, uh, silicon dioxide insulator. Um, but we, we're just pushing the P charges away. Uh, we, we're not attracting any N charges yet. And then 
Finally, we have inversion layer, where once the gate voltage becomes positive enough, more positive than our threshold voltage, we actually start accumulating uh, negative charges or electrons um, right at the gate oxide in the body of the, uh, in, of the silicon. And so we get uh, negative charges along the underneath the, the gate material there. And um, so when VG is greater than VT, we get inversion. So let's talk about in more detail on the NMOS transistor for uh, the time being. So the mode of operation that we're in will depend on the, our terminal voltage uh, of our three terminals, the gate voltage, VG, the drain voltage, VD, and the source voltage, VS. So let's first define um, a couple. There's three different voltage differentials that we could talk about here as well. One is the difference between VG and VS. So VG minus VS we'll call VGS. VG minus VD we'll call VGD. And VD minus VS is our voltage VDS. And VDS could also be written as VGS minus VGD um, if you look at the relationships of, the, of those two previous um, values as well. Now, one thing to note is that if you looked at how uh, our fabrication steps are for PMOS and NMOS uh, transistors, the source and drain um, terminals are actually symmetric. Um, they're identical to each other. Uh, so we could use either one as the source or the drain. However, by convention for NMOS devices, we say that the source terminal is always the lower voltage. Um, and for NMOS, uh, we always connect um, or try to connect the source terminal to ground. Uh, so hence, um, since the source terminal is always the lowest voltage at ground, uh, VDS is always going to be greater than zero um, by that convention. Now, also note that for an NMOS device, the body is grounded. That's because the NMOS device, the body is a P-type uh, bulk material, we want to make sure that our PN junctions in our, in our wafer are never forward biased. So if we connect the P bulk to ground, we could never, since that's the lowest voltage on the, on the device, we can never forward vo bias any PN junction as long as we have the P bulk connected to ground. So uh, we'll assume that the, the P body is grounded. The source is also connected to zero and so our uh, our bulk p and our source are both zero now that being the case uh, we have three regions of operation that the transistor can be in it can either be in cutoff linear or saturation region so one of the regions of operation that an nmos could be in is cutoff region so cutoff region basically means that we have no channel created. Um, and this can happen uh, when our gate voltage is set equal. So our VGS is equal to zero. We have no gate um, accumulation region or depletion region or even inversion region um, underneath the gate. We have no channel created between the drain and source and so we have no current between the drain and source. So if VGS is zero or too low, we will have no channel created and we're in cutoff. Now the linear region of operation is when we actually have enough gate voltage um, on, on the gate to create a inversion region underneath the gate uh, that causes n-type carriers or um, electrons that can flow between the drain and the source. So what happens is VGS is greater than our threshold voltage, so VGS is greater than VT. This will allow current to flow from the drain to the source. 
So electrons, in, in effect, if current is flowing from drain to source, that means since electrons are negative charges, the electrons are flowing from the source to the drain. And the value of the current, or IDS, um, current between drain and source, increases as VDS increases. So as, as the voltage between the drain and the source becomes larger, um, you get a more current flowing uh, IDS. So <clears throat> in this region, it's similar to uh, having kind of a linear resistor. Um, as VGS gets larger, um, the value of the resistance um, goes down and you get more current, um, but it's still kind of a resistive uh, behavior to the current as long as basically when VDS is not um, a very large value. So if VDS is, is smaller than um, basically VGS, uh, VGS minus VT, then you're in the linear region. So you can see that equation basically in the very lower right corner. Um, you're in the linear region as long as VDS is greater than zero, but if it's less than VGS minus VT, uh, you're in the linear region as long as VGS is also greater than your threshold voltage. So the third region of operation that you can be in is what's called saturation. Um, this is where uh, you formed a channel, so you have VGS greater than VT, and you've increased your drain voltage so that VDS is greater than the value of VGS minus VT. So what winds up happening is you formed a channel um, underneath the gate and as you increased your drain voltage, um, the, the carriers um, through the channel uh, start, they, they start flowing through the channel, they get close to the drain and the channel starts getting pinched off. And so there's only so fast that the electrons can flow and as they get closer to the drain, they get swept in and, and they can't go any faster. And so your current basically maxes out at a certain point as VDS gets larger and larger, um, the current stays flat and doesn't keep going any larger. So you're no longer acting like a resistor where your current goes up more as your voltage goes up more. It basically flattens off and becomes more like a current source and it becomes constant current. Um, so in this uh, saturation region, your drain to source current is no longer dependent on VDS. As VDS changes, um, the, the current stays approximately the same. And so we say the current saturates. And like I said, it, it's similar to being a current source. So the equations to keep in mind here um, in, the, uh, in the figure down and below uh, where VGS is greater than VT, and then in the lower right part where VDS is greater than the value of VGS minus VT. Uh, and those basically determine, uh, if those two are true, then your NMOS is in saturation. So next we'll go through how the current voltage characteristics change um, in the different regions. So in the linear region, we said that IDS depends on both how much charge is in the channel and how, how fast the charge is moving. So let's go through uh, those concepts um, going in the next couple of foils. So let's go through how you figure out the charge um, in, the, in the capacitor or charge in the channel. So keep in mind the uh, MOS structure looks like a parallel plate capacitor when, when you're in the inversion region and we have a gate, uh, polysilicon gate. We have an oxide, silicon dioxide layer, and then we have the channel underneath that. So the charge in the channel is your capacitance of your structure times the voltage uh, between the gate and the channel. The capacitance of the structure is Cg, 
um, capacitance of your gate is epsilon oxide, which is the uh, eox, is a physical parameter of silicon dioxide. You can look it up. And that's multiplied by your width times your length of your gate because the area of the gate, the larger the area of your gate, the more capacitance you have. <clears throat> and then you divide by the thickness of your oxide um, because the thicker your oxide is, the less capacitance you get. The thinner the oxide is, the more capacitance you get. Now you can replace, uh, basically C ox is defined as epsilon oxide Divided, divided by the thickness of your oxide. So we can replace C ox in this equation and get C ox times W times L is your overall capacitance of your device. So now the voltage across the gate to channel <clears throat> or the voltage for your capacitor itself, um, here we have VGC minus VT. The reason for that is the gate to channel voltage only starts creating an inversion region after you've depleted the P, to, uh, P carriers. So you need to get up to at least VT to get your depletion region. And then once you're past VT, then you get your inversion region. Um, so that's why your voltage is VGC minus VT. Um, and also your VGC your channel voltage, your, your gate uh, voltage between the gate and channel is not a constant across the channel. On one side of the channel you have VGS and on the other side of the channel you have VGD. So you need to figure out what the average voltage is across the channel um, in order to figure out what your VGC overall is. So I'm not going to go through the equations for that but just need uh, needless to say the VGC value, it turns out, is equal to VGS minus VDS over 2. So if you take that value minus VT, that's your overall voltage value. So the amount of current that's going through a transistor is dependent on the charge um, that's under the gate, uh, which we talked about in the previous slide and also the carrier velocity, so how fast the charge is moving. So for an NMOS device, the charge is carried by electrons. Electrons are propelled by the electric field between the source and the drain. So this electric field is the voltage between the source and drain, VDS, divided by the length of the uh, channel and the carrier velocity is proportional to the lateral, lateral electrical field. Um, so basically velocity V is equal to the electric field times the mobility of the carriers. So in this case it would be the mobility of the electrons. Then of course we need to know how long does it take for the carrier to cross the channel. So the time for the carrier to cross the channel is the length of the channel divided by the velocity of the carriers. So now we know how much charge is in the channel, the Q channel, um, and how much time it takes each carrier to cross the channel. So now we can figure out what is the current through the channel or IDS. So IDS is the charge in the channel divided by the time it takes to cross the channel. This, if we go through the pre previous equations, is mu, which is the mobility of the electrons, times C ox, times W over L, the width of the channel divided by the length of the channel, times the VGS minus VT minus VT VDS over 2 parameter times VDS. Um, you can go back uh, to the previous um, equations to put it all together. And then one of the things that the uh, is a kind of a notation, common notation, is to take the mu C ox W over L figure, replace it with uh, the, the term beta, uh, 
So we'll say instead of mu cox w over l, we'll say beta times vgs minus vt minus vds over two times vds. Now this beta should definitely not be confused with the beta in a BJT, which is the, uh, the, the amount of current uh, amplification you get in a BJT. This is completely different beta. Um, we just happen to use a similar term for NMOS devices or for MOS devices as we do in BJTs, but for a completely different factor. So remember, beta for MOS devices is mu C ox W over L. So the current that I went through in the previous FOIL was the current when you're in the linear region. Um, now we want to go through what is the current when you're in the saturation region. Um, so in this case, uh, basically if uh, the VGD is less than VT, and in other words it's a way of saying uh, VDS is greater than VGS minus VT, then what happens, like I said in uh, previous FOIL, is the channel starts pinching off near the drain. So um, when VDS is greater than this uh, VD sat or saturation voltage, um, that's when VDS is greater than VGS minus VT. So VGS minus VT is also known as the VD saturation voltage of the drain. So at that point, the drain voltage no longer is part of our um, part of our equation for the current through IDS because once the drain voltage gets higher, um, you still have maxed out the current um, and and you now have a constant current going through the uh, device. Um, so the equation now gets rid of uh, VDS and replaces it with VD sat, which is a constant voltage of VGS minus VT. So your current IDS is now beta times VGS minus VT minus VD sat over 2 times VD sat. And it turns out we can rewrite this equation to be beta over 2 times VGS minus VT squared and I leave it to you to or look in the book and you can see the derivation for that. So this is the main thing to remember from from this uh, foil is IDS when you're in saturation is beta over 2 times VGS minus VT quantity squared. So to summarize the uh, previous uh, foils um, we have three regions of operation for NMOS current voltage uh, relationship. One is cut off. When VGS is less than VT, uh, we have no current through the drain, so IDS is zero. Second is the linear region, where VDS is less than VD sat, so VDS is less than VGS minus VT. Um, so in that region, the current IDS is dependent on both VDS and VGS. So the equation for that is beta times the quantity VGS minus VT minus VDS over two, and that times VDS. And then finally, if we're in saturation, uh, we're no longer dependent on VDS, we're only dependent on the VGS voltage. That's when VDS is greater than VD sat, or greater than VGS minus VT, then our current is just dependent on VGS minus VT, so beta over 2 times VGS minus VT squared. Um, so IDS in this uh, situation is a function of basically VGS squared. So now that we've gone through the equations for how much current goes through an NMOS transistor, let's go through a, a simple, uh, relatively simple example. Um, so if in this example we're using a 0.6 micron process, uh, which means that um, the gate length is going to be 0.6 microns, um, and in this process T oxide is 100 angstroms, 
your mobility of your electrons is 350 centimeters squared per volt second and your VT is 0.7 volts. So what we want to do is we want to plot IDS, the current through your drain to source, for five, six different values of VGS, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And so we're going to get five or six different curves on our chart and we want to use a W over L of 4 lambda over 2 lambda. So W is going to be twice as wide. Remember lambda is one half of your critical dimension. So since it's a 0.6 micron process, lambda would be 0.3 microns. Um, but uh, so now let's go. First we want to figure out what this beta factor is, which is mu C ox W over L. Um, w over L is 4 over 2, so we don't actually need to remember whether it's 4, four um, times 0.3 microns or 4 times 0.6 microns because the, the lambda factor um, cancels out, so you just get the 4 over 2 ratio. Uh, so when we multiply uh, W over L mu C ox all together, we get 120 um, times W over L, so 4 over 2, which would be an extra 2 uh, microamp per volt squared. So if we go use that in the equations from the previous slide, um, the five or the six different um, graphs that we're going to chart here are going to be when the, the first one is when VGS is 0, you just have that flat line at the bottom where IDS is zero. Um, when VGS is one, it's gonna be actually a really small, it, it actually is above zero, but you can't see it very well um, because VGS minus VT is going to be 0.3 volts. And so the overall value that you get is, is still fairly close to zero on this particular graph. Um, so it's kind of hard to distinguish that there's a that there's a line above zero there, but there is. Uh, when VGS is two, um, VGS minus VT is going to be 1.3, so two minus 0.7. So you can see there's a kind of a linear increase in the the current until you get close to a little bit over one volt, and then it starts flattening off then you get a flat voltage all the way from uh, 1.2, 1.3 approximately um, to five volts for your VDS value. Uh, when VGS is three, you see the same sort of, you see a line, but it's, it's a, higher, um, a higher slope because uh, your VGS value is higher. And so your slope is gonna be higher it's going to um, flatten off at a higher value because it's VGS minus VT. So it's going to flatten off around 2.3 volts before it flatlines and becomes a constant current. And similarly for 4 volts and 5 volts, uh, you get a slightly higher slope for each of them because we have a higher VGS, um, which causes the slope to be higher. And then the VDS um, eventually uh, as it increases, flattens out at 3.3 and 4.3 respectively. So let's do a similar example for PMOS and do the current voltage relationships. So in this case, uh, for PMOS, PMOS, all dopings and voltages are inverted for PMOS relative to NMOS. So instead of the source being the uh, for an NMOS is the most uh, lowest voltage uh, or ground. In this case, the source for a PMOS is going to be the most positive terminal and is going to be equal to our VDD. Um, and uh, the other thing for PMOS is our mobility of the carriers is for P carriers or, or the holes is what they're called. So mobility is determined by the holes instead of the electrons. Typically, especially on older processes again, the mobility for holes is about 2x lower, uh, maybe up to 3x, it depends on the process technology that you're using, um, but 2x lower than that for the mobility of electrons. Uh, 
Um, so in this particular process uh, that, that we're talking about in this example, the mobility of the holes is 120 centimeter square per volt second. And also, um, so basically since the mobility is lower for PMOS, the PMOS has to be wider to provide the same current as an NMOS device. And as we go through um, these lecture notes, uh, basically we're going to assume that the mobility of N is about twice that of the mobility of P. So you can see in the lower right, um, here would be the graph um, because everything is inverted. Instead of going to positive voltages, we're going to negative voltages because keep in mind we're talking about what the voltage is uh, compared to VDD, which is what the source is. So compared to VDD, um, which might be at you know four or five volts, if you're at three volts, you're negative two volts from VDD. So that's why all of the voltages here, VGS and VDS are negative because they're being compared to the highest voltage in the system. And so they're, they're definitely gonna be negative compared to that. Um, so you can see the chart looks very similar to the previous chart. Uh, just the, everything is kind of, I don't know, you could say rotated 180 degrees um, in terms of how it's plotted out. So let's talk a little bit more detail about capacitance. So any two conductors that are separated by an insulator have capacitance. Um, so, you know, in our MOS transistors, the gate to channel capacitor is obviously very important. Um, it creates, it, it actually helps create the channel charge necessary for operating the device. Um, the problem is, or if you want to call it a problem, um, the source and drain also have capacitance to various different uh, other spots, but um, in particular, uh, the source and drain have capacitance to the body or bulk of the transistor. Keep in mind there's a PN junction um, for, from the source and drain to the bulk, and that PN junction is reverse bias. Anytime you have a reverse bias PN junction, you're going to have um, reverse bias diode, and there is a capacitance to that reverse bias diode. So this is called diffusion capacitance because it's associated with the source and drain diffusion. And this capacitance, along with other capacitances that are in the uh, overall um, circuit and process, uh, will help slow down our circuit. The more capacitance you have as you try to charge and discharge, uh, go between zero and one uh, value and switch your logic values, um, you have to charge and discharge this, this capacitance, uh, which will slow down as you have more capacitance, will slow down your how fast you can um, switch between zero and one. So let's talk a little bit more detail about the gate capacitance. So we can approximate the channel as being connected to the source, uh, which simplifies our equations a little bit, and say that uh, our capacitance from gate to substrate or gate to source is gonna be epsilon oxide divided by T oxide times W times L, our width and length of our uh, gate. Um, another way sometimes that they'll do this, uh, since usually you're, you're gonna wind up using in digital logic minimum gate length uh, devices, so you can take that minimum gate length and, and instead uh, replace it with a, instead of C ox, do a C oxide per micron of the device to, and based on a, a given uh, device length um, that you assume. And then that just gets multiplied by W. Um, in the 0.6 micron process that we've been talking about um, in the past few slides, uh, there's basically the information is it's typically about two femtofarad per micron. So the last thing that I wanna talk about in this particular section is our diffusion capacitance. So I mentioned that uh, the diffusion has capacitance to the substrate. So we have uh, capacitance from the source to body, 
CSB, and we have capacitance from the drain to the body, um, CDB. So this capacitance is typically undesirable and it's called a parasitic capacitance. It's capacitance we would rather not be there, but it just is there by the physical nature of the PN junctions. So this capacitance depends on both the area of the PN junction and the perimeter, because keep in mind the PN junction goes vertically into the substrate, so there's it's kind of like if you had a hole that you were digging out, that hole has a bottom of the hole, uh, which is, you know, basically flat, and then it has sides of the hole as well. And so you have a certain amount of capacitance around the perimeter based on how deep the hole goes and the sides of the hole, the area of the, the sides, and then the area of the bottom. So the idea here is uh, we want to try and use the smallest diffusion nodes that we possibly can in order to, to reduce this undesirable parasitic capacitance. Um, now this capacitance is comparable to our gate capacitance, uh, CG, um, for uh, contacted diffusions. Um, but there could be, so if you look at the figures on the right, uh, let's say you had two transistors that you were connecting in series with each other. Um, you could actually lay out two separate transistors, connect them together, by metal and and basically have two contacts in between the two transistors connecting the drain of one to the source of the other. That would be the uh, drawn out fi figure on the, the left. Um, obviously that has a whole lot of capacitance because you have a drain one and a source two, both are fully, um, fully figured. Um, a different way we could do that is we could uh, have the drain of one transistor share with the source of a second transistor and take up less overall perimeter and area and thus less parasitic capacitance and um, that reduces your capacitance. Um, if you had to put a contact there it needs to be a certain size of 6 lambda in this case um, in order to meet the minimum design rules but if you didn't actually need to connect to the middle between those two transistors, depending on the structure that you were making, um, you, by not requiring a contact in there, the minimum distance between your two polys could be three lambda. And, and then you've really, really reduced the parasitic capacitance of that merge diffusion in the middle there and made, basically you're gonna make your overall uh, stack here a lot faster by getting rid of that extra capacitance. One thing to note is obviously uh, this varies a lot by process technology and also um, by the process from one manufacturer to another depending on how deep um, their, their uh, drain and source uh, diffusion layers go and how much carrier concentration is in that um, can make your capacitance vary.